Welcome to the Alouette's Flight Deck, podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouette's football, presented by Sport Buff. I am your host, Tim Capper, along with Cliffy D. Hey, buddy. How are you? Hey, it man. is that time. Kind of. <laughs> kind of, yeah, because, my God, it, we after so long, we finally have Canadian Football League football back. Mm-hmm. But not the Alouette's. <laughs> just <No>. yet. <laughs> It's like, well, slow, slow your roll there, buddy. Uh, you, you, you guys sit this one out. So uh, week one has officially, well, will officially be underway probably by the time you folks are listening to this podcast. But the Montreal Alouettes, unfortunately, will not be playing this week. No. So we got to temper our enthusiasm just a little bit. Just a touch, just a touch. But that's okay. I mean, we, we do have some things to talk about. We also got a great interview with the new voice. Of the Montreal Alouettes, Sean Campbell, and that will be coming up shortly. Um, and uh, first thing I'm going to, it's sort of like a housekeeping type of thing, but, you know, we talked a, a bit last week on how, you know, based off of what the Quebec government mentioned, that we would be able to have up to 15,000 uh, 15, fans. And, you know, I did not know that there had been a story in the Journal de Montréal, nor did you. That's why, I guess that's why I started following them. Um, it seems that uh, Mario Cicchini had an interview with them talking about just that exact thing. And it was determined that, by the looks of it, it's only going to be about 12,000, min- at least a minimum of 12,500 fans will be allowed to be in Percival Molson based off of social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, which was, which we did talk about last week. And also what was also sent out to any ticket holders or when you buy tickets, what's also mentioned, as as you said, in the email and stuff like that. So they're going to possibly get up to 15, but with all the social distancing that they're doing and the, them going with the 15,000 max at Percival Molson based off of the full capacity of 25, which is what they're going by. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, it's it looks like it's only going to be a maximum, but at least a minimum of of twelve five. But hey, you know what? As long as it is still fans there, I'm 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 all happy for it. Yeah, it's a start. And again, as things go, as these protocols change and evolve, as things go by, I mean, we're, again, we're, I was starting to get a little bit worrisome because you know we were doing so well for the start of the summer, and now it looks like things are starting to dip back down into the bad zone again so it's it's a little bit iffy right now i mean it's really hard to speculate what's going to be it's going to be like say in like november and december Mm -hmm. how things are i mean like i said everything is fluid at this point i mean things can change at the drop of a dime and you know you 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 just never know so you just got to roll with it the best you can i mean 12-5 if that's what's going to end up having to be for the first couple of games so be it. If they can get up to the 15,000, that'd be awesome, too. At the end of the day, we're still going to get at football. And to me, that's what matters more than anything else. Like, I know I'm extremely stoked to be finally back inside Percival Molson Stadium. I know you are, too. Yeah. I know there's a lot of fans as well that are very excited about being able to sit down and watch live football again. I mean, I mean, how, how do you not be excited for that prospect? Yeah, and before we started, actually, the Alouettes sent out uh, an email. I think you may have received it also, uh, talking about how now that your digital ticket is now available, they tell you how to where to go and get it. Um, it wasn't there yesterday afternoon when I checked, and then I think uh, uh, I was speaking with uh, another one of our, our I guess, uh, another one of the our fans who sit in the same row as we do, and they were there. So currently the 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 digital virtual ticket is there so the qr code is there so if you haven't already mm-hmm. make sure you figure out a way how to how to log in to your uh you know to your ticket portal so you have access to these tickets yeah exactly so i've got mine essentially at the ready so that's that's very cool like i said that's one of those things that kind of makes you feel like okay this is really happening like mm-hmm. we, we're actually this is going to happen we're going to actually see football this year and to me, that's that's a great sign as far as uh, like just the little things that it takes to get people excited about uh, an upcoming football season. That would be it. Like, unfortunately, you're not going to have those, you know, sweet t- ticket deliveries that you used to have back in the day. But, uh, you know, just give me that email saying that, OK, here are your virtual tickets. It's time. So like to me, that's that's a good thing. I'm, I'm taking it as a good thing. And I'm hoping that uh, 
anyone else who's a ticket holder, whether it's uh, you know full, a full time season ticket holder, flex pack, or single season or single game ticket, I should say. Just getting that ticket, knowing that it's going to happen, you're actually going to go see an actual football game or two or seven this year. <laughs> it's exciting. It's or exciting. Eight. It's just or eight. Or eight. That's right. That's right. I got to think positive. Yeah, it could be eight. So, or or in some cases, possibly nine. That is true too. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> so yeah, um, it seemed that the that the the pre sale went very well for single game tickets, and then they're open. They're fully open now to the to the public. Um, if you head over to the Alouette's uh, ticket site, you'll, you'll see what's currently available. And they're all social distance. You can't miss it. I think it's actually pretty unique. Um, some sections seem to be completely sold out uh, or at least almost virtually sold out. Uh, didn't mean that that was didn't mean to include that dad joke in there. But, yeah, virtually sold out for those virtual tickets. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I said, by all means, they're now available if you're looking to come to a game uh, this year. Uh Everything's currently fluid, so anything could change on as you said with the drop of a hat. So we'll we'll see what happens. But either way, uh, either way, it's good to see. But we still have, you know, we, we still have until the twenty seventh in order to 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 deal with this. So we have to deal with a bye week, two games, and then a home game. So we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So uh, a couple of other things too um, before we talk about the final rosters, etc. Um, we want to at least mention that one of the co-owners or co-partners of the Alouette's ownership group, Sid Siegel actually died. Um, and I, I will admit, you know, somebody reached out to me on social and said, you know, did, did you actually know how old he was? I, I had no clue that he was as old as he was, but still, and I guess that this is the, I don't want to call me the cynical fan or the uh, devil's advocate in me or, 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 but you know, I hear that Sid dies you know, obviously our, our, our thoughts are with his family during what's happening. But then my thoughts, did my thoughts wrongly go to the fact that now there's only one person who's part of this ownership group? And where did most of the money come from? A- am I wrong to be worried already that these owners, owners haven't technically had a game in their tenure and I'm already worried? I, I think it's a little premature. I mean, I think... Obviously, things had to be put in place well beforehand. I mean, to me, what I take more than anything else is the fact that, uh, unfortunately, Sid Spiegel passed away without having a chance to actually yeah, see yeah. his football team play. Like, to me, that's a major bummer. I mean, it's, you know, like, I, I know that Gary Stern is more or less considered the face of the ownership group. Like, he's the one that's out there front and center and doing the interviews and the press conferences and all that stuff. And I believe Sid Spiegel is kind of more like the silent partner, kind of just the, yeah, uh, that's what they said. Yeah. Like the, the, the money bags, if you will, <laughs> it's a kind of a funny way of putting it, but uh, yeah. you know, I, I it's, it's just unfortunate it's, at the end of the day, though, it still is disheartening that, you know, that one of the members of the ownership group is no longer with us and never got a chance to actually see the team in action. So it's, it's unfortunate. As far as what you're bringing up here, and I, I can see you're playing devil's advocate, and that's fine. I don't really think it's going to affect anything. I have to believe, like, the, this isn't the first sport owner to pass away and basically bequeath the ownership of the team to a family member. And yeah. I think that's pretty much what it's come down to. And I have to believe that's what it is, or it's been put in trust or something like that. I'm Again, that's sort that's of something similar to what happened within BC. Is that what you're saying? Right, right, and David Braley, the uh, who is head of the ownership group out in BC, like he ensured in his will that there is plenty, plenty of money to run the BC Lions for many years to come, which is astounding and mm-hmm. remarkable to even think about. I have to believe there's something similar set up here, whereas you know the family will be taken care, you know, take care, make sure that the bills are paid and that the Alouettes are still a, very much a functioning group. I couldn't imagine. I mean, I've been wrong before, but I couldn't imagine, you know, having to have to find new ownership as a result of the passing of a, a member of the ownership group. But I mean, it's the CFL. Stranger things have happened, unfortunately. So at this point, I mean, I'm not too concerned about it. I have to believe that Gary Stern believes in this football team and will, you know, if if nothing else, soldier on in memory of his father-in-law, essentially. And ensure that this team remains successful, remains in Montreal, and remains a viable part of the CFL community. Yeah. Um, I, 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 and again, I, you know, it, it is true 
that Gary Stern is the the face and the voice of the ownership group, which is you know we uh, we never, as far as we know, never heard had an interview from Sid Spiegel. Um, but again, it had it still had to be something to be mentioned because um, you know it, it's that day. You know it, it, we had heard about two deaths basically. You know we heard late we heard about Sid from from Herb Zerkowski, and we heard about you know um, you know Lynn J. Schnell dying. Are passing away at 39, even though he didn't play for the Alouettes, it's still, you know, to have two prominent CFL members Types. pass. Yeah, members. Yeah. So. No, it's uh, yeah. I mean, Lin J was definitely a surprise because you know he's he was 39 years old, uh, still in really good shape. He hadn't been playing uh, football in a while, but uh, you know, still was looking forward to contributing. I, mm-hmm. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he was uh, lined up to be coaching or teaching at. Uh, high school like his local high school and you know that to me is just what the cfl was all about is giving back to the community any way shape or form yeah. and so it sounded like lynn jay was all set to do that to help uh mentor the future if you will and i you know it's it's such a it's, it's so dis, disheartening like i said it's it's unfortunate to see someone that young too i mean he's a young man I mean, and yeah 39 is young and it's <laughs> It's tough too because I, I do I will know because I didn't hear it through the C, through my CFL family I heard it through my arena football family, and so you know two fan bases are are, are mourning obviously far as loss so it's yeah it, it's tough it it really is but I'm gonna give props by the way to all of his teams that he played for in the CFL all had a, a statement put out on social mm-hmm. media so I applaud them for that so yeah definitely yeah. definitely um. Where to go? So much more to talk about. Um, it was announced today, obviously, with the start of the season coming up on Thursday, the 5th, that, and it seems to be every year somebody put it on social media. It's like, why do you guys always announce the stuff now? You know, <laughs> with the good, you know, with their good uh, you know, Jerry Seinfeld impression. Not. Um, the You know, both the ESPN Network of Families schedule came out. And so did the announcement for Sirius XM. Um, uh, first, uh, to me, it's a no-brainer. It's just a matter of them actually doing the announcement. Um, you know, it seems to be like every year that that CFL and the and ESPN Network of uh, Family Networks always seem to, you know, partner up so that there can be something in the U.S. Whether it be on ESPN, ESPN News, ESPN Two, they forget any ESPN Three. Uh, well, ESPN Plus, actually. Oh, sorry, ESPN it's... Plus. Plus, yes. Yeah. So, but that and then seeing also that not only will all CFL games, including the playoffs and the Grey Cup, be on Sirius XM, but uh, they also up their contract for another three years. I think it's another three, yeah, another three years, so. Which mm-hmm. is cool. So if anybody happens to have, if you have a problem getting your local station for whatever it may be, uh, and you have Sirius XM, you can send it to it in the radio on the radio and voila, get your fix to CFL. And obviously, you know, yeah. As a th- the one thing I took away is that uh, they, they were they were very expressive of mentioning that you will be able to listen to every CFL game in English. Mm-hmm. And if you want to listen to Alouette's games in French, yes. you can do so as well on Sirius XM, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Yep. I mean, like it's all about trying to reach as many people as possible. And that is the way to do it is to reach everyone and that's the great thing about sirius xm is they definitely do reach everyone you can pick it up anywhere you can listen in your car you can listen online listen at home i mean there's no shortage of ways to be able to listen to this incredible product which i've been a fan of for many many years Mm -hmm. so to see the cfl re-upping with these guys definitely is a win a massive win as far as i'm concerned oh for for sure for sure and i was trying to find them here here it is uh the station specifically that you can listen to them on Sirius XM Canada is uh, Canada Talks. It's channel 167. And then the French language broadcasts of the Alouettes games can be heard on uh, Influence Franco on uh, channel 174. Yeah. So no excuses, folks. I mean, especially you, Alouettes Nation. If you want to listen to your team play football on the radio, that's how you do it. Mm-hmm. There's no excuse not to miss a game this year. Exactly. Exactly. So, and, and also, uh, at least I have to mention too, since we were talking about it, uh, RDS also made the announcement too that uh, their CFL, compl- I think it's their, a complete schedule also of CFL games that are going to be on RDS, the RDS networks, right? Uh, yes. Well, obviously, all the LOS games, yes. that's a, yes. a foregone conclusion, yes. but they are 
broadcasting a vast majority of other games as well, including what well, there was a bit of a, a leaning towards the, uh, the the Ottawa Red Blacks or the Rouge et Noir, as they're called uh, mm-hmm. on RDS. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, of course, they were going to get a lot of uh, a little bit of pub as well. But uh, there, there seems to be quite a bit of a market now. Like a lot of fans in Quebec want to watch CFL football and not just the Alouettes. They want to watch all the teams. And if you don't necessarily want to watch them in English on TSN, you can do so now on RDS or RDS2, which is excellent, excellent news as well. So, I mean, this is, as I said, reaching as many people as possible nationwide. French, English doesn't matter. If you want to listen to Canadian football this year, folks, there are more than enough ways for you to watch it, listen to it, participate in it. I mean, this this league is, I've said on numerous occasions, you've got to engage your fans especially if you can't get everybody into the stadium because of uh, COVID protocols yes. and limitations and all that, at least let them watch at home. Let them listen to it on the radio as they're going out and doing what they do throughout the day. This is the way you reach fans. And this is the way you help strengthen that resolve between your fans and your product. Simple as that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, Hey, yeah, there, may, there may not be an Owls game this week, but you're still, you can still get your fill. That's the main thing. Shall we bring in our guest and have a chat with him? You know what? Yeah, it looks like you're right. He is ready. He is on the line. And uh, uh, we will speak with the new voice of the Montreal Alouettes. And when we get back, uh, we got a few more things to talk about. And with us for this episode, we have the man who's going to be your new voice of the Montreal Alouettes. On the line with us now is Sean Campbell. Hey, Sean. Thanks for joining us, man. Hey, no problem. Glad to join in. I love this podcast. Um, I want to, want to ask you a question. I mean, it's, you know, you and I have been talking back and forth on social media and stuff like that. And everybody who knows who's been following the owls for, you know, for the last decade plus knows that Rick Moffat was the, was the voice of the Alouettes for all these years on CJD and, and TSN 690. Um, when were you first approached to become the new voice uh, of the, of the Alouettes? Oh, approached. Um, <laughs> you know, how's this? My boss has told me, let me do the math. What year are we? We're 2021. Yeah. They told me in March of 2020. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. They, they told me in March of 2020. So I've actually known this for over a year and a half. Uh, I, I went back and like nine months later and I was like, is that still the case? Are we still doing that? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. We are. Uh, but yeah, you, by the way, you mentioned Rick. Let me give me a huge shout out to Rick. Yeah. Uh, I worked alongside of Rick. I filled in for Rick uh, over the last few years when he had to do soccer. And then there was uh, football at the same time. And I got to fill in. And, I, and that's one of the reasons, I guess, that I got the opportunity is because I filled in when he wasn't. But also there was a season when Brian Chu mm-hmm. was supposed to be the analyst. And then uh, his, uh, he had a, an illness in the family and he had to leave. So we kind of was a mishmash. I did a lot of analyst job that year, and I loved it. Uh, I remember I called the uh, Johnny Manziel's first game that year uh, alongside Rick. And so I've worked alongside Rick, and uh, I, I've done a lot of hockey. But I've, I, I've always loved the way that Rick Moffat calls a football game. So I'm, I'm hoping to, to bring a lot of that life, energy, and passion that he always did. Uh, did he, just out of curiosity, before we continue it further, did he happen to give you any advice or anything like that? I mean, I mean, does, I would imagine he knows you're going to be the new voice I'm guessing, but I mean, it's, did it give you any well, advice follow, going forward? Well, I don't know if he follows you guys on Twitter, then he knows. Okay. Because that's, pretty, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, uh, I, I advice, but I mean, you've talked about the job and how, how it works too, but I haven't, I haven't had a conversation with Rick in a while, but it's not that we don't uh, interact socially right. or I don't have his phone number or right. we don't uh, come back. But but again, uh, you know, congrats to you guys because you guys pretty much knew before most people knew. Mm-hmm. So I don't even I don't even, I don't know if Rick knows, but maybe he does. Okay. But if he follows you guys, then he should. I would hope. I would hope. He, he, he's about to learn then. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rick. <laughs> um, for those who who don't know and don't know the you know when it comes to being a radio play by play man or being an analyst or stuff like that. Um, Sean, what, what is a normal game day like for you, whether it be soccer, whether it being you're going to be the actual play-by-play or the actual analyst or the color guy? What, what's a, a normal day for you when it comes to getting prepped for uh, that week's game? 
Uh, I love getting there early. If I'm doing a Habs game, if I'm doing a Rocket game, if I'm doing an Owls game, early is for me. I usually do a lot of prep work if I'm on the road in the hotel because, you know, sometimes it's just mentally prep. And I do a lot of handwritten notes. I like to uh, write it out by hand right? because half the time I don't even look at my notes down at, below me, but I know that if I wrote it, then it goes right into my brain. It's right. kind of this weird study tactic that I have. Um, but for me, it's always get there early. Uh, at least I would, and I say early football, I haven't gotten to my routine of what I will do. I'm not sure just yet, but if say it's a seven o'clock start, I would probably want to be on my way there by four, depending on road, or maybe there's a media bus that I have to take versus an Uber on my own. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure of those details just yet, but, uh, I w- I'll need uh, two plus hours to get there, get settled. Uh, I know Rick liked to walk the field. I, I'll see if I do that. I might do that a little bit just to observe a couple things. But uh, for the most part, I, I like to get there early. I like to have my notes set up and I like to have everything good to go. If the game is at seven, it's good to go at six. And then I can settle in if I have to do a pregame show or not. Cause then that's a whole other half hour of preparation. Are you a, a big stats guy where you like to, to you know, whether the league gave it to you um, or whether somebody in the Alouettes PR gave you a, an actual unique stat or, or, or will you be like the person who's, who also reached out to the CFL statistician like Steve Daniel to get some inside tidbits that maybe many people won't know? Yeah, it, I'll probably use, uh, not that I wouldn't use a CFL statistician because you have to have that connection, uh, but I used to work for CFL on TSN, and for all the Alice home games, okay. I would uh, I would do um, uh, the extra stats, the bonus stats. So you, have the, you have the down and distance guy, right? Uh, but I would be behind the scenes, and I would do uh, hits, hurry, sacks, uh, pressures, uh, you know, uh, drop balls. I had this whole chart of stats. I love stats. I love looking at that stuff. So cool. yes, the only problem is I won't be able to track that now because I did that behind Chris Cusper, Rod Black, all those guys on TSN uh, behind the scenes for the last five, six years. Yeah. And so that's one of the other things I've watched them prepare. I've watched them do play by play. So that's also helped me. So it's funny. They asked me this year, TSN like, Oh, we got another season coming. Sean, you're going to do that job again. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing play to play on my own now, so <laughs> no. Uh, I've actually passed that off to Mo Khan, and oh, cool. uh, Mo Khan, who he re- he replaced me a lot when I couldn't do that. If I was replacing Rick, Mo would do that. So now Mo's got that gig. So I'll, I'll probably turn to Mo for like he might drop some halftime stats for me. But uh, CFL on TSN has a great guy, John Perlberg. I'm going to give him a shout out. Mm-hmm. He is so good. If you don't follow him on Twitter, CFL, he put up this whole stat stuff. He's done such a good job, and I follow him. I'm friends with him. I know him, so I might use him a little bit. But, yeah, yeah I, I like to use the numbers. I like to look at the numbers. Well, as from time to time, I always say check my Twitter feed because I usually come up with a pretty pretty good doozy that I usually speak with uh, Steve Steve about, and I usually put it out on Twitter. So, uh, Well, tag me. Tag me. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll get right on that. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw it in. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'll name drop too, man. I'm – I'll name drop stuff here, here and there. I'll drop, I'll drop some podcasts. Uh, what every three games you want a podcast drop? What did you tell me? You, sure, tell me. you broke the story. If I, if I can, yeah, if I can drop you, I drop you a good. Uh, or, you know, if I send you something via Twitter or by text, yeah, for for by all means. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. you go. You got my number now. So yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, what what's the most when it comes to setting up for a game that you've had so far in your career? What's the most frustrating thing that you've had to deal with? <laughs> the first game I called football. Oh man, this is funny. So the first game I called football, they so they asked, me, "Hey Sean, can you do preseason?" I've never called football before in my life, but I used to go to my bosses all the time and say, "I want to call football. I want to call football. I want to call football." Right. And I think they they put me there as a tester. I think it was 2017, and they just did a tester because the moment the game was over, they said, "Oh Sean, we need you for these four games this year because there was conflicts with Rick." And then I, they put me on, and I did I did an okay job. But man, CFL preseason games, I am glad there are none. <laughs> there was one game, there was twenty, there was three twelves on the team, and I don't. It's preseason CFL. You don't know who these players are. Yeah. And then at one point, there was this guy returning kicks number twenty five. I remember his number. No name bar, no nothing, because it's preseason. It's a home game for the Alouettes. He was not on the list. No one at twenty five. Gallo was working the sidelines. I text Gal. I'm like, who's 25? 
goes, I don't know. He's like, he even asked the PR guy and the PR guy didn't even know the guy's name. <laughs> so okay. I'm calling return kick returns. And they're like, and the Alouettes get it at the five to the 10 to the 15. Like I had no idea who the player's name was. <laughs> I, I started making up names at this point. I think by the end of the name, by the end of the game, I called him Washington. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, boy. Once an Alouette, always an Alouette. I see you, Washington. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's frustrating. I can imagine. At least, at least right, people uh, can't see bet you banging your head up against the microphone during the broadcast. But, but then I'm also thinking, I'm like, whoever's listening to this probably don't know who that guy is anyway. So if I make up a name and I just run with it, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, hey, they just say that's, fake it till you make it. Fake. Yeah, that's 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 how I felt when I did like Montreal Junior games. I'm like, no one knows these players. So it doesn't matter if I screw up. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I love it. <laughs> I am so gonna have to put the Sirius XM uh, uh, broadcast or or you know the TSS 690 broadcast up against the TV one of these days just to hear because I'm sure I'm, you're gonna pull up some gems, Sean. I can just imagine. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna have some fun with it. I'm. Re- I really am. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do things my way, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a lot of fun, and I hope the Alex fans are gonna enjoy it. Yeah. Are you gonna be doing a a pregame show or a coach's show or anything like that? Yeah, we'll probably depend on the uh, the time of the game, depending on what our programming is before. But uh, usually, it's at least a half an hour or an hour pregame okay. before, and at least half an hour uh, after. So I don't know the uh, uh, the exact details. Like I told you guys, I'm currently on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's a weekend game, likely an hour pregame will happen. And that's fine. It'll be a lot of good time for uh, Marco Olivier Briette and I to get to know each other. I've called a couple games with him. I know him decently well, but I'm looking forward to getting to know him a little bit more. Cool. Cool. Cliff. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Marco because I was about to ask him uh, or about I'd ask you regarding him. Uh, you've called a couple of games with him. What would you say would be the most memorable game that you've called with Marco? Oh, oh I don't know if I can answer that because I'm trying to trying to think of the exact game that I called that was with him. I, I think I've called two games with him because he's only been an analyst a little bit. And last year I didn't, or the year prior, Rick didn't take any games off. So I haven't called a game since so 2020, 2019. I haven't called a game since 2018. And I think Marco was only replacing a guy at that time. So, uh, I, and then the specifics of what game it was, I'm not sure. Uh, but I'm looking forward to hanging out with him. I, we do a lot of interviews on air, and he's a good guy. We have a lot of good uh, meat versus vegan battles. So, because I'm a, definitely a meat eater, and he is a very proud vegan. So that might come up. That might come up during the broadcast. Oh my gosh, uh, that will be quite the interesting debate to uh, to be had on the air. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I told you there's going to be a little. It'll be a little different nuances this year. <laughs> now, from what you've seen so far of the 2021 Alouettes, I mean, unfortunately, due to the, the fact that uh, there's no spectators at training camp, we really don't see and know a whole lot of what's going on. We're just going based on reports and that. From what you've seen so far, what what can fans be most excited about this year? I'm excited about their quarterback. And the fact that they have a quarterback that has experience starting in the league, I think you got to be excited about that. Vernon Adams Jr. Be excited. That honestly, most of their receiving course intact from a couple of years ago. Now I don't know the chemistry is there. I think that's what you have to be excited about. Defense, I'm not sure. I know that there's some good pieces that are still there, but man, defense changes every year, anyways. And now you're talking about a two years removed from COVID. I have no idea what to expect from the defense. But be excited about the quarterback. There are some good quarterbacks in this league, and I think Vernon Adams Jr. is one of them. And I think that having you know the, the bulk of his receivers that he knows from two years ago coming back will benefit the Owls more so than other teams. That's awesome. To yeah. me, like, that's, that's going to be the key, it absolutely, is the offense. Because, yeah, defense wins championships. But, uh, I mean, if you can't put points on the board, then... Uh, you know that that's that's huge yeah, right there. A, so it's a CFL, man. It's a CFL. Points are points. You, you remember that year that they could like they could hardly hit thirty every year. Mm-hmm. They got to hit thirty, thirty-five every time. That year that they was like twenty-two, twenty-one, and they and they, and their defense did all right, and they got everybody. But you got to hit thirty in the CFL. You got yeah. you have to. No, full stop. Full stop. I'm I'm thinking, Sean. What people keep talking, and I keep seeing this in the media, is like the sophomore slump, slump, sophomore slump for Vernon. Now. And I'm thinking, dude, stop. Because I think what people are forgetting is that 
far as I know, Vernon was the only one who technically had a, a camp or um, a, you know, a, a throwing day with his wide receivers in Seattle. Nobody else in the yeah. CFL, as far as I know, a starting quarterback did that. There's there's something about this kid, man. And I call him a kid because I'm really old. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, there's something about this kid. You know, you heard the stories. He was an Uber driver, and then he was going to do something else. And then he flew when he got his contract. He flew all the receivers in, uh, and and he brought him in. So he so just so he could train with them and watch him, like little things like that, man. There's something about this kid that I'm excited about. And that's why you asked me what to get excited about. And I think it's Vernon Adams Jr. Is he going to be, you know, perfect? Is he going to be the next Anthony Calvillo? Let's back up a little bit. Let's sit back and enjoy it. But I think that there's going to be something special. There's no doubt that he's the starter. I love that. When was the last time that the Alouettes went into a training camp that there wasn't a starters battle? There isn't. I think Schultz is good. I think he's a good quality CFL quarterback. And he might find a home somewhere else, or he might find a home here in Montreal because we know football is a violent sport that there's a lot of injuries. Mm-hmm. But uh, like that story, I love that story. I love every little story that I heard about Vernon Adams Jr. I love the story of him becoming a Habs fan, that coming to Montreal early. They're just he's accepted this, he's running with it, and he's gonna he, he's gonna be a good face of the franchise. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's no there's no question in my mind. He has definitely embraced Montreal, and I I sincerely hope that Montreal has embraced him back as far as throwing him support and showing him the love and all that because he's definitely done that for this city. So I'm, I sincerely hope that the fan base is going to do likewise. Yeah, I, I think so, but that's it's up to him to do it now. So yeah. but he's uh, got to go out there, and then they'll, they'll get excited about it. What do you think about what's happening this year? I mean, obviously you're going to be are going to be allowed to call – the games this year in front of fans and stuff like that. Um, what, what's your view on how the CFL has dealt with the, with COVID in 2021? And, and I guess what, what the Montreal organization has done to look at what it looks like for, for them to keep everybody safe, but also for allow fans in the stadium this year. Yeah. That's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Cause it's like what the CFL has done. We haven't seen what the, what the reaction is just yet. Like, how this is all going to play out, but the CFL is meant for fans. You need fans. You have to have them. It's interaction. I think you guys know that yeah. it's the interactions that you guys have with Rough Rider fans, with Red Black fans, with Argos fans, with Tiger Cat fans. It's, it's it's about that interaction. And when you don't have that interaction, the, the CFL fizzles out. You absolutely need it. So it might be baby steps at the beginning and uh, the CFL will take their time with this. But the fact that every stadium will, will have fans, I think is a good start. Uh, I can't wait till we get to like, I hope that, you know, the Grey Cup will have a actual Grey Cup party, not a virtual Grey Cup party. Yeah. You know, like I think everybody understands that, but I don't know if we're going to be able to get there, but I think the CFL is doing a good job getting everybody back. We know we're at a certain stage. Is there going to be another pushback in the fall? Is there another going to, who knows? You can't look too far ahead. Just look to what's in front of you. And for the Alouettes right now, it's the first game in Edmonton. And then it's Calgary, and then they're back home against Hamilton. So I think that's kind of the first window. And then after that, take the next step. So Alouettes fans, just take it slowly. We'll see what is, what's going to happen. But I, I don't know how it's going to play out in the end because you can't control this. You, you just kind of have to take it in the chin as it comes. Mm-hmm. Or or as we're finding out these days, you've got to take it in the arm. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Sean, I got to ask you, uh, your partnership, you and Mitch Gallo partnering with uh, LaBrosse Brewery, how did that come about? Uh, because as far as, I, as far as I know, you're the only play-by-play man in the CFL that has his own craft beer. That's true. It is sold out, and they're working on a second batch. I'll let you guys know about that. Yeah. And I am wearing my LaBrosse hat right now. Um, but, uh, so we were doing our podcast together and post game fights. And then, so we, we were looking into our third partner was looking to get a brewery sponsor, but then there was random, this guy on social media that his girlfriend works at the brewery, but he loves Gallo and I, and he goes, guys, I can make this happen. And he was like the broker on it and he broke the whole deal. And he, he came up with the ideas about the beers and everything. And, uh, our partnership now with Ross and Alex, like we're we're full on, and we're we're looking not what we've done, we're looking to what we want to do in the future, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's pretty fun. It's been it's a nice combination to have, 
uh, for our podcast. And that's one of the things that we do with post game finals. We did a lot of half content, of course, with the Canadians going to the Stanley Cup final. But uh, no doubt about it, Gallo and I will be doing some house content too. So that that should be a lot of fun. That's cool. So is it so is it like podcasting with beer type of thing? Oh yeah, like <laughs> a lot of time. Like, well, that's you know we we open the beer at the beginning of the episode, and usually we have one or two by the time of the end. We we're pretty quick on our episodes. Yeah. We uh, we you know we don't you know there's those podcasts that last two to three hours. Mm-hmm. You know we, we we bring it down a little bit. Yeah. You know we're we're busy guys. Mm-hmm. So so no time for the for the beer cup snake, I guess. <laughs> oh no, we could I could do that in like a quarter if you want. <laughs> I I've, I've had three I've had three beers in this conversation that we're having right now. I told you I'm at a restaurant, I'm at a bar. I ordered another drink while I was talking to you guys. So nice. <laughs> That's nice. I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, wonderful so wonderful no, I'm, not, I'm not holding back. Yeah. Um I'm I'm on vacation. What's the what are the what are your I know you, as I said, you're on vacation. You've seen just a little bit of the Alouettes itself, but uh, yeah. What, what do you, uh, what in your opinion, what what do you see? How well do you see the Alouettes doing this year, and how far can they go leading up to a Grey Cup 2021? I think second place would be a good spot for them. I, I I've watched more Owls than I have Ottawa and Toronto, but I think those are the ones that I think that they're better than. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Hamilton's the best in the East, uh, just with the returning players that they have. Um, but I, until I know what this defense can do, maybe they can go for first. But if you're asking me before the season, I yeah. gotta say second. And, but and, I'm not ruling out. I'm not ruling out third. I'm not ruling out first, and I'm not ruling out fourth because I have no idea until they play a game, and there's no preseason to determine anything. Yeah. It's really, it's really hard. Yeah. You know. But uh, because I told you about the quarterback, I'm, you know. I, I'm gonna say that uh, second is where I'm looking at in this division, at least. Right. So uh, I guess you have to be you'll be basing your information what you're going to get off of Joey Alfieri who you know your colleague there who who, who showed up at the uh, uh, Joey. yeah who showed up at the uh, the scrimmage the second scrimmage that the Alouettes had yeah he says he goes but let's let's be honest okay let's, he's busy with the CF Montreal okay <laughs> he's, he's, that's it that, that's his bread and butter so <laughs> yeah I love I love Joey trust me and we talk a lot of CFL and and, and that's the other thing is like just like you know at the station and stuff. I've been hosting like the Owls this week since 2008. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been on the Owls beat since 2007. I, I, I was in the, you know, the 12 men on the field. I was field level covering that, that game. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that's I cool. was in the, I was in the great cup in Toronto. The Owls weren't in that one, but I was there. I was in the great cup in 2008. Uh, you know, I've, I've covered this league and I've covered this, this sport for a very, very long time. Just because Joey boasts about it doesn't make him smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, last thing I'll ask you now, I'll let, I'll let Cliff finish it up. What's your... Uh, What's your whole thought on this XFL thing that, that you've seen? And I think it, it really didn't help today either that, you know, we're on the cusp of the CFL season coming back after, you know, after our break yeah. because of COVID. And then the com- and there's a whole story about the commissioner talking about, hey, well, we may talk again with the XFL. I'm thinking, stop, dude. I know. Look, I could tell you're a CFL purist. I'm a little bit on the other side. I was all for it. I, I was all for it. I, I I dove into the XFL. I was excited about the XFL because I'm I'm the kind of guy that loves all football. I love all football. I can watch. You give me two teams playing football, I'll watch it. I'll do it. Oh, uh, oh, oh don't 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 take don't get me wrong there, Sean. I, I just meant we were yeah. on the, we're on the cusp because I was listening to it because oh, yeah. it, uh, as like, Cliff will tell you, I, I follow the Arena Football League for 20 years. So I mean, it's I'm into the yeah. So hey man, if no one followed the Arena Football League, no one would have found out how good Billy Parker was and uh, Gerald th- Brown. Let's, thank let's, you. Let's, come Ex- on, exactly. Let me or, name drop a little bit here. Chad Owens. There's another one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I was I was all for what this could have been, and I'm not saying it won't be. But I I I sometimes I think the CFL needs help. I think it needs a little help. Yeah. But if it keeps the the context of what the CFL is, I'm fine. Uh, I know they did the big expansion down south, and it was kind of a bust, and that's fine. Uh, but the XFL needed help. The CFL needed help. And I think everybody needs help right now. Yeah. Right. This mm-hmm. is COVID. Everybody's trying to figure out to try and make a buck and no one wants the CFL to disappear. Yeah. And if it took the XFL being involved, 
I was fine with it. And if it took The Rock's personality to get involved, I'm fine with it. I'm a, I'm a wrestling guy, so I'm down with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't want the, the heart and the soul of the CFL to go away. And I would have been mad if it just was turned into the XFL and we never heard of Canadian Football League and it was just the XFL in Montreal. I would have been like, okay, come on, you should have put up a better fight than that to keep your namesake in there. Yeah. But uh, I'm I'm curious about what could be if they need the help because let's be honest, CFL needs money and we know here in Montreal they need a little extra dollar or two. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad there's new ownership and I and I know that uh, uh, Sid Spiegel passed away and and shout out to his family and and all that stuff. And I love that it's going to be a new era in, in Montreal, a new general manager and all that stuff. I want to see it happen first. I want to see how this plays out before we make any decision long-term. All right. I agree. I agree. Cliff. All right. Well, uh, just to take us home, uh, Sean, we definitely appreciate you joining us. Uh, before we head out, though, uh, how, how do fans find you on social media, if they haven't already? Uh, Sean R. Campbell is straight up my name, S-E-A-N-R Campbell, like the soup. Uh, I sometimes tweet about my boys. I'll tweet a lot about, you know, my travels in the CFL for sure. And uh, I, I'm, I like to interact. I don't take myself too seriously. Block anybody. So you can be as angry as you want me. It's cool. It doesn't bother me. I know what Twitter is. Uh, it's the same thing for Instagram, but Instagram is really not much sports for me on that one. Okay. All right. Well, we're looking forward to hearing you on the radio. That's right. That's, it's exciting to know that you talk about this whole new era thing with ownership and team and everything. That, and now you're a part of that as well. Mm-hmm. So we're definitely excited to see what you bring to the table. And uh, like I said, best of luck. We're looking forward to seeing you this season. And, uh, let's, let's do this. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. I, for one, am interested to see how he, how Sean puts his stamp on the on the Alouettes broadcasts. And I think, to me, the most interesting thing, Cliff, is that he's known since March of 2020. <laughs> I, I tell you what, he's really good at keeping a secret. <laughs> I'm like, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I th- one thing I didn't ask him, and I don't know, because you know how some of us, like myself, have for some reason have catchphrases at the end of the show or something. I'm, I'm curious to know if if he's going to have something like that, or if uh, if he's uh, t- if it's just going to be uh, you know, thanks for listening. We'll, we'll talk to you next week, type of thing. I guess we'll have to tune in and see, won't we? That's right. So whether it be on hey <sighs> on uh, TSN six ninety or on uh, on uh, Sirius XM. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> uh, no games. Uh, we'll get to the uh, the rosters here in a minute, but I, the CFL also, it sounds like it was like a, a plethora of stuff that the CFL just dropped today. CFL or TSN just dropped today. Um, they, they dropped their CFL top 50 players for 2021. Hmm. And may I say, I'm disappointed that we were not asked to fill out a ballot. <sighs> well, no, not really. Not yeah. really. <laughs> um, it it would have been nice to at least been nominated. It would have been, but... it, yeah, it would have been cool. Uh, but the, I guess I'm not surprised with the final numbers. The Alouettes ended up getting, uh, six players on this list and it's, it's right in the center of everything. You know, I, I'm not surprised that Hamilton ended up getting 11 and stuff like that. But, uh, what were your thoughts when you saw the breakdowns of how many, what the distributions were by team? Uh, well, I mean, it really comes down to the best players, uh, on which teams they play for. I mean, Hamilton is has been the cream of the crop for the past couple of years. So it's not a surprise that a lot of their players are on the list uh, with Montreal being represented though. Like they're in about middle of the pack with uh, six players, same yeah. as Calgary. So uh, no surprise. Ottawa red blacks only have one player. Because... I, was, I was, I was actually, wow. <laughs> that, that's kind of a slap in the face. A, a bit, but I mean, I guess that's just the way things are now. I think with uh, Brad Snopley retiring, that probably didn't do Ottawa any favors, at least their numbers any favors in regards to that. But, you know, and we, pl- it we, is what, we lost one, it, too, with John Bowman retiring, too. Big time. So, I mean, like, it, it is what it is, right? So, I mean, I mean, like, now, now it just comes down to, OK, these guys have to live up to the hype because, you know, being top 50 of anything is is still pretty impressive when you think about it. Yeah. And any before we get to where our guys are, are ranked, any surprise about Speedy B being number one and him being placed over B, Bo Levi Mitchell? Really? Uh, I mean, Brendan Banks, he was the he's the defending most outstanding player, technically, 
from 2019. So that really wasn't a surprise to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as far as quarterback goes, uh, Bo Levi is still the standard as far as I'm concerned, as far as Canadian quarterback or Canadian football league quarterbacks go. Uh, he was dinged up last uh, or in 2019, but he still managed to put together some, a, a pretty impressive resume, all things considered. So, I mean, I'm not surprised to see him ranked where he is. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not surprised at all to see Brandon Banks uh, pretty much on top of the list. And here's my question to you, because our, our first player is actually William Stanbeck at 12. But one th- one, before we get to William, are you surprised that Cody Fajardo is ranked higher than Vernon Adams? Because Cody Fajardo <laughs> was seventh. I am Surprised, but I'm not surprised because I'm sure a lot of the media out west. I mean, they, you know, I don't want to say they're they're favoring anyone particularly, but uh, I mean, Cody Fajardo definitely is getting a lot, a lot of love, not just in Saskatchewan, but pretty much most of Western Canada. Like they, they seem to believe in him. They like he's become the the the, the darling out there. So, and listen, he's 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 proven himself as a, a solid quarterback. Uh, I mean, almost went to the Grey Cup. So, I mean, you, you got to give props for that. So, I mean, that's just what it comes down to. Do I think he's a better quarterback than Vernon Adams? I mean, it's, I mean, it, it, there's so many variables in play when it comes to a question like that. I mean, to me, I, I think better is a subjective term to begin with. So it's it's very tough to say. Uh, I'm of the opinion, though, that I, I probably would have ranked Vernon Adams ahead of him, not to sound like a homer, but it's just uh, when it comes to the overall body of work and what they've had to work with, uh, at least in 2019. Yeah. I, I think Vernon Adams turned in a much better report card than what for, uh, Cody Fajardo did, despite the fact that, yes, Fajardo did uh, it basically come down to one play from him being a, a part of the Grey Cup in 2019. But, I mean, you talk about the overall I'm, – I'm looking more at the overall body of work and – I think for what with, with what Vernon Adams had to work with, I probably would have ranked him just a just a touch higher than Cody Fajardo. Not to take anything away from what Fajardo has done for the Rough Riders, but I got I got to back my man VA. That's really what yeah, it comes down to. Yeah, and you know what? If this can give him Vernon some bulletin board material, by all means, by oh, he's not- all means. Oh, he's not he's not lacking in that. Like just the fact that people are calling, you know, talking about sophomore jinx. Oh when it comes yeah, to yeah. I was talking what? talking to Sean about that. Yeah, come on. That, that's ridiculous. I mean, like you're talking, you're talking as if he's like a wet behind the ears kid who is, you know, just just getting to know the CFL. The dude's been in the CFL for a number of years now. Now, mind you, he's okay. It's technically his second full season as a starter for a team. I'll, I'll give you that. But the, the 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 way it comes across is like you know, it's just like some dumb rookie that just doesn't know what he's doing. That's not the case. Vernon Adams knows this league. He knows what it takes to win. And, and you know what? As far as I'm concerned. Go ahead and disrespect him because he knows how to shut people's mouths. And I think he's going to be doing a lot of that this year. And I'm here for it. I, I'm ready to see what Vernon Adams can do. As far as I'm concerned, like he is focused like never before. Yeah. He wants this so bad you can taste it. And you and I know what Vernon brings to the table oh, yeah. each and every game day. Yeah. I mean, we don't we don't have to sell you folks on on Vernon Adams Jr. As far as I'm concerned, but to all these uh, all these doubters, everyone who's put him down as you know. You know, was he six, number sixteen on this list? Go ahead, that's fine. And he'll prove he'll prove you wrong. And technically, technically, isn't this the sophomore season for Cody Fajardo? Sure, if we're gonna play that game, I know. Come on, I, but you haven't heard that term said at all for Cody. No, you, you you've got him out to be the next <laughs> Drew Brees. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, like sorry, no, like you, like like I said, no disrespect towards Fajardo, but. I'd say he's 1A, 1B with uh, Vernon Adams. As, as far as you talk about experience, you talk about uh, you know the, the stats, the numbers, what they've brought to their respective teams. Yeah. Because I, I'll, go, I'll go so far as to say, if you had a different quarterback at both of those, you're not going to see the same records that you saw for the Alouettes and for the Rough Riders in 2019. That's how it, what it comes down to. But for, like I said, any number of reasons, Fajardo is like the, the next great quarterback of the Canadian Football League, and Vernon Adams is just some punk ass. According to these clowns, yeah, exactly. like whatever. All so, right, you you want to you want to think that that's fine. I the one thing we do know about Vernon is he fuels this fuels him. This I, I bet he's I bet he's loving this. I bet he's yeah. loving the doubt because he I I know, I know that he would love nothing more to shut everybody's mouth and shock the world. And you know what? He'll do it, and we will all be witness to it. Yep. Uh, what's your thought on? I think it's pretty high praise that. Uh, um, 
that William Stanbeck is, even though he is listed as 12th on the list, he's, he's the second ranked uh, running back on this list. Yeah, second of three. I mean, like running back, it's both positions. Like when when you're good, everybody knows it, and there there's no question. Like William Stanback has all. He was making himself a superstar in this league in 2019, and I, I think it's just going to continue in 2021. Like I mean, he's going to run roughshod over people. Uh, I, I'm I'm really excited to see uh, to know that he's back, and uh, I know he went to try and pursue his NFL dream and didn't come to fruition. That's fine. I, I I definitely see him coming back here and just reinforcing that household name. Like he was really starting to become a budding superstar in this league in 2019. And I think if he turns in another similar performance, and especially now with uh, Andrew Harris kind of being dinged up, to what extent we don't know exactly. But if William Stanback gets a chance to get in there and really prove himself as he has in 2019, I can't help but be excited to see what uh, what can become for William Stanback in in the Canadian Football League. For sure. And as we said, uh, uh, VA was placed at 16th on the list. Um, the next Alouettes player after that um, is all the way down at number 27 with Armando Sewell. Mm. Which is great because uh, he was a free agent addition to the Alouettes. Uh, he, he's been really balling out in camp, too. And despite being, uh, I don't want to say elder statesman because it sounds offensive to someone like that, but I mean... <laughs> Uh, Almondo definitely knows what he, he he knows what he can do out there, and seeing him part of this defensive line, which everybody was w- so worried about. Uh, Danny Machocho was worried about making sure that this line was going to be. He, he thought this was a weak point when he took over as general manager of the Alouettes back in 2020, and vowed to make sure that this defensive line was going to be the talk of the town. And adding someone like Sewell to the to the mix, along with Nick Usher, uh, Cameron Lawson, David Menard. I mean, like, these are players that will step up and be a major part of this uh, defensive line. And with Sewell essentially assuming the John Bowman role as far as being the unspoken leader of this of this group, he's got so much experience to share. He's won championships. Uh, I'm definitely excited to see what uh, Armando brings to the team. And, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely very excited to see what he can do, especially sitting at number 27. I think it's definitely well worth it. And... Quite frankly, I'm excited to see what uh, Sewell does bring to the Alouettes in 2021. Does putting Eugene Lewis at 34 uh, give uh, is is it a slight on him in any way? Considering what he's brought to the Alouettes in in 2019 and how he's imp- he's progressively improved year after year after year, I think he, could, he should have at least been in the top 30. But I mean, like there, there's definitely some very talented players in this league. There's no question about that, and Believe me, I I don't envy the ones that had to try and sort all this out. But, I mean, leading the Alouettes in receiving in 2019, uh, his playmaking ability is second to none as far as I'm concerned. I Honestly, I would have definitely liked to see Gino a little bit higher than that. Like, yeah. I'd even go as far as, like, put him 25. Like, 25 and up. I, I definitely think Gino belongs in that category, especially with the connection that he's had with Vernon Adams. I mean, True. he's... He's proven himself to be a gamer. I mean, he he's thrown a touchdown to Vernon Adams. For <laughs> You're <allowed>. right. <laughs> and, and the best he could do is 34. Come on. <laughs> but, all right. All right. You know what? That's fine. That's fine. Uh, 36, Patrick Levels. Oh, well, listen, Patrick Levels, I don't have to sell you on Patrick Levels. So the guy hits like a truck. I mean, he, and he's also, too, essentially become a leader on the defense as well. Uh, as far as linebackers go, or and the linebacking core in the secondary, I mean, like he he moves in and out so so easily, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing him just lay people out, just to put the wood on people. I'm I'm really excited to see what uh, Patrick brings, and I think just he he came this close to being a Hamilton Tiger Cat, like he signed with the Tiger Cats in 2020. I know, and I wonder if you know I you know have, I don't want to say regret doing so, but I think it's just a matter of like okay, maybe I can make this work out here. And then realize, okay, he has a chance to come back to Montreal. I think he realized and remembered what he had in Montreal, how special it was in 2019, and how he was such a huge part of that. And the fact that he was able to sort of get out of jail free, if you will, by having only signed a one-year contract with the Tiger Cats that ended up being all for naught. Coming back to Montreal, having a chance to prove himself defensively for this team yet again, I can't help but be excited. I think uh, I think he's going to have a banner year this year. And lastly, which is a very big surprise to me, the recently switched to number five, DB Greg Reed at four. I said at forty-three. Mm-hmm. 
Well, we've been big Greg, Greg Reed proponents for a number of years now. Yeah. I, I told him back in 2018, I fully expect you to be an all-star in this league in 2019. And sure enough, that came to, that, that came to pass. And I'm so happy to see what he's, he's able to do. Like he, he's a baller straight out baller. Oh, I know. I know. And, I think people were starting to realize and recognize that. And I'm, I'm glad he made this list. Once again, like I, I definitely think all these guys could be just a little bit higher. Greg is no exception. But just the fact that he actually made it on this list shows that other people have been paying attention. They see what we are finally starting to see. And I am definitely expecting another massive year from uh, from this young man. I, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what uh, Greg can do. A new number. I mean, he wore number five at Florida State University. Uh, I know it's uh, something that uh, with the the recent rules about uh, numbers ch- being able to change, like being able to select which number you want, I think that was a, a huge thing for him. Yeah. Uh, I I kind of laugh because his first year here he was 33, La- uh, 2019 he was 26, and now he's now he gets his number five. So I I don't believe changing numbers is going to affect your gameplay, but I mean it does affect your mental attitude mm-hmm. and what you bring to the table. And if it sounds to me like like his, his Twitter handle, for example, is G5 Takeover. So it's definitely a part of him, the oh, number yeah. five. Even back to his and days in that, the Arena League, it is. Yeah. Yep. And if that kind of just seeps into your head just a little bit, you just get that into that mindset, that championship mindset, that, that mindset of just doing what it takes to go to that next level. Like, I think Greg is already at a, a very high level as it is, further influenced by the, the All-Star nomination that he got in 2019. For sure. Taking that and just bumping it up that much more, Folks, how, how do you not get excited at the prospect of that? I, I, I'm really expecting Greg Reed to become a household name in 2021 for the Alouettes. And not just in Montreal, but CFL-wide too. I really expect you to hear his name each and every week on TSN talking about how dangerous he is, how receiver opposing receivers don't want any part of him. Like the, even the, Or the quarterbacks just don't want to throw in his direction because they know that he'll either knock it down or pick it off or, or just – disrupt you and put the mic on them if there are any more mic'd up games put we as we saw especially in the game versus uh the, you know the comeback versus winnipeg mm-hmm. put the mic on them <laughs> yeah yeah be ready with the sensor button because you know he, he gets hype but uh yeah. um, i'll tell you what folks like that that's what it comes down to you want you want to talk about entertainment in this league greg reed is going to bring entertainment on and off the field in 2021 uh, if you were to pick one person who didn't make the top 50. Oh. Uh, and only hmm. one. Only one. Only one. That, that really stands out to you. I mean, I will say for the most part, the, I expect to see everybody on there that I did. But uh, if I had to pick one player, uh, I'd probably go with uh, Jake Winecki, to tell you the I, truth. That's funny. I was just about to say the exact same thing. I, I, I mean, like, you Hamilton refl- doesn't need two quarterbacks in the top 50, for Christ's sake. Uh, yeah, that that was a little bizarre to me. But considering okay, you know, the other teams, you know, that means two teams did not get a quarterback in the top fifty. Mm-hmm. No, that's it. And like I said, unfortunately, with the the current Alouettes that are in place, there wasn't anyone that really truly stood out. But uh, I mean, Jake Winecki. I mean, he was he became, he came out of nowhere and became a favorite target for yeah. for Vernon Adams. Uh, in addition to Gino, so I mean, I definitely would have liked to have seen him on there. Uh, but another name that. Uh, should have gotten an honorable mention would have been Antonio Simmons. Yeah, uh, he he turned it on the, the last part of the season last year. Uh, as I said, I expect him now to sort of assume that John Bowman role a little bit as well. In addition to Sewell on the offensive line, or the defensive line, uh, young man, he still has his best football is ahead of him, and I have a feeling that he's going to take that next step in 2021 for the Alouettes on the defensive line, and he just may end up becoming a household name himself. So if if you were to put him on the list. Like I said, he probably was just below 50, but uh, I could see with another solid season, maybe actually cracking that top 50 and really making a name for himself in this league. Yeah, for sure. Um, the, the Finally, I think we went I think we went through everything here. So you can think of something else here, Cliff, before we get to it. But finally, you know, as the, the raw, well, the fi- well, go ahead. I was going to say, like, in your opinion, of the, of the players that are on this roster, like, do you see anyone – having a breakout year that uh, aside from the ones that we've mentioned, do you see anyone having a breakout year and why? I, you know, we really haven't defense to me is, is really the toughest to choose. Um, and the main reason why is that, you know, we really haven't seen them. So we're basing everything on, um, 
I mean, Rashawn Simon is probably one, one that I've been looking at. I mean, he's, he's been given his fair share of chances here in the CFL, and, and maybe he just needs that chance because now he's going to be the uh, the Canadian receiver. One of, yes. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know what I mean. It looks like he's going to be the main Canadian starter. So well, that's, that's a very good possibility. And, uh, yeah, he's he's – had, he's played for a couple of teams already. It just, like I said, I maybe just wasn't the right fit out in uh, BC or Winnipeg. But uh, and this maybe maybe this is the magic elixir. Like maybe being in this system here, working with uh, Robert Flash Gordon as the coach, uh, working with uh, t- other talented receivers like Gino, BJ, and mm-hmm. and so on. I definitely think, uh, yeah, Rashawn could definitely be uh, one of those guys that really stands out. I think BJ too, by the way, really needs to make a comeback after him being hurt. And see that that's the plus, I guess, is that. You know, they're all, they are all, they seem to be all healthy. Um, unlike from what we've heard from some others in the, on other teams in the CFL with be what, no matter the position, mm-hmm. BJ seems to be healthy. So I'm, I'm looking out for another breakout year from him too. So, yeah. And he's kind of become the elder statesman. Again, I hate using that expression for, <laughs> for someone yeah, I know. who's guys who that are younger than we 30. are. I mean, it's it's kind of laughable to to consider him as such, but I mean, like he's got he's got the most experience on this team uh, on, as, as far as the receiving core goes. Uh, he's been here the longest. Uh, he knows what it takes to win as well. I mean, and when he's on, he is on. He is definitely on another level. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely expect him to sort of really assume that leadership role and just just ball out. And I, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Like when it comes down to like who's Vernon going to lob that insane pass to the options he has is 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 incredible just to think that you've got like Gino Lewis you've got BJ Cunningham you've got Quan Bray you've got Jake Winnecki you've got Rashawn Simon you've got Dante Absher who yeah. I think also too has the potential to become a superstar in this league as well I agree it just just needs that chance and I think I think the Alouettes are going to give all of those guys a chance to really become household names like like we talk about those like TSN highlight of the night kind of plays those are the guys that I know are very capable of doing it. Like I see Vernon just hucking the ball downfield 40, 50, 60 yards. Those guys jumping up that 50, 50 catch and they're going to make it. And it's going to be outstanding. Like we are going to be jumping out of our seats at Molson stadium and going, Holy cow. I can't believe he caught that. Exactly. And to me, that's what makes it so exciting. That's what makes this league, this team so exciting. The, the potential that is on here is through the roof. And I, I, I am just so excited to see how it's all going to come to how it's all going to come and play out. Yeah. Um, first, before we talk about the, the, the final rosters and what, what we have seen and who made, who made the, who made it on the team for the 2021 season. We first want to at least mention that um, we want to thank our, our presenting sponsor for the show for this month. Uh, Sport buff. Uh, Chris and Gary are they're They're legends when it comes to, Merch, sports merchandise in the Montreal area. If you know the name Sport Buff, you know exactly what I am talking about. Uh, they have everything that you can ha- get, depending, no matter what sport. CFL, yeah. NFL, Major League Baseball, and more. So if you head over to sportbuffshop.com, I think they're currently running a, 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 another promotion, if I'm not mistaken. But if you head over there, give the place a look. It's not just like your normal site that you would see online. Just give them a. Just go ahead and give them a look, and uh, I would say tell them that we sent you. But <laughs> they're not going to know. But uh, yeah, uh, we want to thank them for being the uh, presenting sponsor, and also for allowing us to help give away the uh, the merch that we're going to be giving away, which just happens to be. If you happen to check on social media, we've been talking about it all day. Uh, it is a an Alowitz cap that you cannot currently get over at the Bo- Alowitz boutique. So and, we're talking exclusive merch. For Cliff, who is not a cap wearer, to say that that he would potentially buy this to wear shows how much how 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 fire this this cap is. I gotta tell you, like I said, not a hack guy at all. I is it's just it's I never liked how I look in baseball caps, but uh, I mean like I look at this hat and I'm like that is so cool. Like that that is the kind of hat you could rock downtown Montreal. You're going out with your friends and you know, hitting the clubs or you know, I, I guess people don't do that anymore, do they? With yeah, COVID? Not, not the moment. <laughs> okay, so I guess you could walk in the park. Uh, <laughs> what? what the hell do people do anymore? I don't know. I've been cooped up in my house for way too long. <laughs> you know what, folks? It's a nice hat. Let's just put it, it is, Let's leave it at that. It's a nice hat. Buy it. Wear it to the stadium. You're going to have a good time. 
that's all there is to it. Go to Sport Buff, God damn it. Yeah, yeah that, 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 hey, wow, that that's the commercial. Go to Sport Buff, damn it. Um, if you want to uh, put your hat, your your name, your hat into the contest, <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> see see how excited we are folks about Woo! giving this freaking hat away yes um we are. if you we want to really put your, are, so. if you want to put your name into the hat for the contest for the cap there we go i got it out i got it out uh we need you to respond to any of our tweets any of our tweets with the hashtag sport buff flight deck sport buff S P O R T B U F F flight deck. And we'll make the announcement on our next show. Cause we got more to come. We got more to come. Hey, once a week, at least, at, at least, at least. Also, uh, if you are, uh, a avid listener and you may have happened to listen to an episode, or if you're a new listener, uh, you can head over to Alouette's flight catch up on all of the archives for all of our shows, heading all the way back to 2016. Um, also, you can listen to it on any podcast aggregate, wherever it may be. There's so many of them. Right, Cliff? I mean, it's... Uh, God. Uh, I've, yeah, I've said it before. I, I think it's easier to find... It would probably be easier to list where you can't find the Alouette's flight deck. I mean, whether it's uh, <laughs> Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, what have you. I mean, we're even on YouTube for crying yeah, out loud. Yeah, head I over mean, to like, YouTube. Yeah, go over to YouTube, listen to it. It's the full audio podcast uh, please subscribe, like, give us a review. We'll be uh, greatly, it'll be greatly appreciated. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, again, uh, we appreciate you guys listening for all these years, and uh, um, we hope you to continue, to continue to do so for many years to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally, finally, we have the rosters, and yes. one of the, and what's funny, Cliff, to me. And we already talked about a few of the people that, that made the rosters, you know, where Sean Simon is being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, what I thought was interesting, and it's funny for me to think about this, is that because of what's happening this year with the COVID and the COVID protocols, et cetera, the, not only do the Alouettes have a, have, a, um, have a practice squad, but also there were players placed on the CFL. They call it a CFL practice squad also. I don't want to call it the COVID yeah. squad, but CFL, because that really sounds bad, because it's not what it is. Yeah, it's not quite a COVID squad. No, it's, no uh, but it was... It, they, do, they do call it a, a CFL practice squad. Yeah, which I thought was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would, that was, that's one of the funny, of all things that would, that would stand out to me. Um, any surprises for you? I think the, one of the few surprises for me that really stood out is for the first time since 1986... The Alouettes are going to go with two kickers. That is very, very surprising to me. Uh, I think what really surprised me more than anything else is not just that they went with two kickers. That that in and of itself is definitely surprising because for, like you said, since 1986, it's pretty much been double duty as far as it, if you're going to be a kicker for the Alouettes, you're going to have to kick and punt the ball. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like they're going to be doing, you know, one's going to be doing kicking, one's going to be doing punting. We're not sure between Joseph Zima and David Cote who's going to do what exactly. I know. Uh, that to me is also kind of intriguing as to of of the two. And let's not forget too, Joseph Zima from Australia yeah. occupies the designated global position that each uh, CFL team has to has to be able to fill. That's true. So I'm I'm. I'm fascinated. Like, what? How do how do they decide who's going to do what? Like, we we still haven't gotten a whole lot of word as to uh, the who's going to be doing what. If who's going to be the kicker, who's going to be the punter? But uh, to me, that's that's really interesting. And the fact that uh, Felix Menard Briere, who was in camp, I, uh, former I think, by the way, I think I heard Zima Zima may be the uh, the place kicker. Okay, I think. Well, but I can, we'll find out. Again, we'll find out. We'll find out. Uh, as as I was saying, uh, Felix Menard Briere. Uh, didn't make the cut for the Alouettes uh, as a kicker, which is surprising considering he is a former Montreal Carabin. And a lot of people would automatically assume that if you're a Carabin, you were definitely going to get every opportunity to shine for the Alouettes, mm -hmm. seeing as how Danny Machocha is the former head coach there and probably recruited a lot of these players himself. So he was at least able to bring in as many former Carabins as possible. And while quite a few did make the final cut, there were quite a few that did not. And the fact that Minard Briere didn't make the cut really speaks to just how good of a camp that both uh, Zima and Cote had, in addition to Matt Mangle, who is part of the CFL practice roster for the Alouettes, also a kicker slash punter. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, this kicking competition it really is uh, – it, it's really surprising just how it's all shaping out. So I'm really curious to see who gets the final nod between Zima and Kote as far as who will actually be the place kicker for the Alouettes. Uh, I mean, it's you, you've got a national kicker. You've got a global kicker. Yeah. Who, who ends up uh, getting the final rose, so to speak? Yeah. Oh. Um, just as a, uh, a quick hat tip to Steve Daniel, uh, the, the stats legend that he is for the CFL, who was able to help with this information. Uh, the last time, Cliff, uh, that we had uh, two or more kickers, you'll understand why when I say that, two or more kickers, I'd say it was 1986. It was Roy Kurtz, Mike Mateague, and Xenon Andrusishan. And I think uh, McTeague and uh, Andrew Shishin split time in 86, but uh, they did it in uh, the first two did it in 85. These two, three did it in 86. So uh, as soon as I heard that, I had to find out their information. And uh, again, thanks for, for Steve Dana for his, uh, for his information. Mm. So um, besides that, what, uh, what else stood out to you specifically? Uh, I'm really surprised to see a couple of names on the practice roster because I fully expected them to be part of the full-time roster. Uh, that would be Dominique Termanson and Junior Luke. These are both CFL veterans, uh, both well, still young men, but uh, they are CFL veterans. They, they definitely know this game and have played extremely well, especially Termanson for the Alouettes uh, over the years. Uh, I'm I'm really like I know that the defensive line battle was going to be a real dogfight yeah. to the bitter end, and that's really what it came down to. And the fact that Junior Luke, again former Montreal Caribbean, uh, didn't quite make the cut like to be on the uh, the game day roster, but ends up on the practice squad. I was very surprised to see that. Uh, again, I guess just that it speaks to the level of competition that came about this camp this year. Same thing with Tremanson because he knows the system up and down for the Alouettes. Uh, he's definitely proven himself to be an extremely Valuable player, being a national, uh, being a na- national defensive back, right? Uh, he can slot in just about anywhere. Usually, he plays uh, free safety as well. Uh, for him to be able to take up any part of that uh, secondary, I think is a tremendous tool to have. Uh, does great on special teams as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm really hoping that it's just like it really does come down to the numbers sometimes and being able to field the best team possible. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, Mark Antoine Decoy is going to be the starting safety for the. Alouettes or or Ty Cranston. So again, you got national national guys occupying that safety slot, same as it was in 2019 when it was uh, Taylor Loeffler and uh, Bola Combo. Yeah. So being able to slot those guys in you know, and have it be the national position is a boon. And I guess it just came down to numbers more than anything else as far as Tremanson goes. But as I said, he's versatile enough that he can he can play safety. He can switch over to either one of the uh, defensive back positions or even go halfback as well. I, I'm. I, I got a feeling he won't be on the practice roster for very long. I, I think you know injuries happen, and sometimes it's just a matter of just being ready when your number is called. And I think Dominique will definitely be ready to go when it comes down to it. Same thing with Junior Luke as well. I mean, like these are both players that I think can play at an extremely high level. They've definitely proven themselves in this in this league for a number of years. And as I said, to me, practice roster is about not veteran players waiting for someone to get hurt it's supposed to be about young players waiting for someone to get hurt <laughs> i i mean to me as far as i'm concerned i think uh termanson and luke definitely should be in the mix as far as being a part of the game day roster but uh like i said we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens that first game out in edmonton lots can change a lot can change in practice as well this upcoming week so we'll see what happens but i am surprised to see them on the practice roster but i have a feeling they won't be on there for very long that's just my thought on it uh we've seen in the cfl this year that some teams are actually are going with three quarterbacks on the roster uh saskatchewan's one of them if i'm not mistaken uh what are your thoughts i mean i'm not surprised at all as i said that, that our that our number two quarterback is going to be exactly who it is i mean it's it's you know Considering that Schiltz has been here for quite a quite a while, and him backing up at Vernon seems to be he's done pretty well. What was your <clears> thought though on who our technically our third string quarterback is, who is placed on the on the uh, on the practice roster um, in uh, Nick Tiano? I'll be honest, I don't know very much about Nick Tiano. Yeah, uh, but uh, especially to, like some of the other names that were brought in as uh, camp arms. Uh, that didn't make the cut. Uh, Brock Rudder being one example. I was actually given uh, a nice little uh, send up on him, and I'm actually really surprised that he didn't make the cut. But I mean, this thing playing this league is not easy, folks. Especially when it comes to the quarterback position. I mean, it's you're you're not just going to come up here and tear it up. I mean, I think that's been proven time and time and again. 
you know, there's there's a lot of work to be done here. So I'm curious to see just how Nick Tiano, of all the camp arms that were brought in as far as quarterback goes, I think he realizes he's not going to see much of the field, if at all, barring either Adams or uh, Schultz getting injured. But I guess if all the, the 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 arms that they brought in, like he seemed to be the one that sort of understood this game the most. So it'll be interesting to see as as the season goes by, like just how how he progresses and uh, if he's able to kind of catch on to it and maybe even get a couple of reps at quarterback one of these days. Yeah, it should be interesting. And and I obviously we haven't seen what the you know God forbid things happen. I'm once the first. Um, you know, once the first lineups come out and the depth chart, I'm curious to see who's going to be listed as our number three. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting, that's for sure. Yeah. And also to like the the dreaded emergency quarterback situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, technically, Gino Lewis has played quarterback. He could, in theory, do that. Jake Winecki, I, I, re- I remember seeing uh, throw a nice pass to Quan Bray back in 2019 as well. I mean, weirder things have happened, folks, but. Uh, I mean, that's that's the thing. Like being able to only designate two players as a quarterback in this league uh, definitely makes for a very interesting wrinkle. So, I mean, all you can hope for though is just that you know you got to keep your quarterbacks healthy, keep them healthy, and keep them ready too, because you just never know when the number is going to get called. Yeah. Uh, any obviously, we're just going by names here. Anything else that stands out to you from uh, who made the roster or who didn't? Uh, that was it. I mean, like a lot of the cuts we already talked about last week. Yeah, uh, those yeah. were the uh, those. I guess those are the big things. I mean, like, it was just more like as the, like, the final cut down day happened, it was just more like cleaning it up and then de- deciding who is actually going to make it on the practice roster. And to me, that's more the surprise than anything else is some of the names that I've seen on the practice roster. But uh, as we just discussed, but, uh, you know, I think uh, I think the Montreal has built themselves a very competitive, solid foundation here. And to me, like that's that's what makes this first week of CFL football kind of frustrating is the fact that we know we got some studs here. And we got to wait till next week to see them in action. And we can't even see them in action at home. We got to watch it on TV as they go out to Edmonton and play the Elks. That's that's tough. That's that's a little bit tough. I'm not going to lie, especially seeing as, you know, er, like I said, everybody else in the league, you know, they're all excited because they get their football this week. We just got to we got to be patient and wait our turn yeah. and we'll do it. We'll wait. I mean, we've waited this long. Really, what's one more week, I suppose. Right. <laughs> yep. No, I know. And, you know, what we've. What we said already, and, and, you know, we're, hey, we're hoping that because we're not playing, Edmonton is, it gives us a, a heads up. So we, we'll have to talk to our, our friends over at the, uh, over at the uh, Turf District to see if they actually agree with us. I'm curious to know what they, what they think about that, but we'll, that, that'll be, that'll be for, uh, that'll be for next week. Well, and that's the beauty of, uh, with football starting back up is uh, we get to re re-inter- reinteract with all of our friends over at uh, Turf District with Piffles with all the other podcasts that are out there. I'm I'm looking forward to some friendly chirping back and forth and uh, maybe a little bit of collaborations. You know, as as games go by and we you know we start figuring out uh, you know just how these teams are like because again we're all sort of in the same boat in the sense that we really truly don't know what we've got until we see them in action mm-hmm. and. I mean, like unless you were lucky enough to have a, a team play a scrimmage game, but and you were uh, you as a fan were allowed to attend. But again, I yeah. digress. Um, uh, to me, to me though, I'm I'm excited to see what's going to happen. I'm excited to have football back, and you know, it, as I said, I've waited this long for the Alouettes to play. One more week's not going to kill me. Yeah. Um. Real, just real quickly, because it was something that I, I was going to bring up, but uh, I was going to bring up another segment, and I forgot. What are your what are your quick thoughts on this on this CFL protocol that was announced where they're mirroring what the uh, what they're doing with the NFL is that depending on the percentage of, of people that are vaccinated may determine if there is a breakout if a team uh, gets a win or a loss in the in the uh, a, a def- a, a, with a forfeit loss uh, or a forfeit win and then potentially not being paid based on that percentage of players being vaccinated fully vaccinated well i mean listen i know you can't force players to get vaccinated i know it, it's unfortunately it's not 100 percent across the board that'd be awesome if it were but it's not and that's that's fine i i understand why some folks are still reluctant to do this i mean i i don't agree with it but i understand the reluctancy mm-hmm. and that speaks to the players as well but at the same time knowing that you your refusal to do this and God forbid there's a another outbreak or and now we're hearing about uh, other variants that are coming about and could be possibly coming our way as well. I mean, like 
to me, it just seems like a, you know, just just go get the damn shot. I mean, that's that. It's easy for me to say that, you know, because I'm just uh, Joe Blow in the stands. Yeah, but uh, yeah. for players, like I understand some of the frustration, some of the concerns, what have you. But uh, I mean, I don't know if I could, f- how good I would feel knowing that if I put myself in a position where I would, you know, contract this team couldn't play, couldn't get a win. They're they're given a loss as a result of a forfeit, and it's costing money which is and that's really what it came down to is being able to play this year and being able to make money as a professional football player to provide for your family if yeah. you've got one and to help further yourself as a football player you can't do that if you're not playing if you're if you're in isolation because you decided you didn't want you don't trust the vaccine or you don't trust any of that stuff it's tough it's 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 a tough situation but i i don't think i would want to have that burden on me knowing that i may have inadvertently cost my football team a chance to win. I may have cost my coworkers a chance to make some money and provide for their families. Like I, I don't want to say that everybody should be forced to get this vaccine, but and that's kind of how the NFL and the CFL are kind of taking it is to sort of I won't say railroad you into getting the vaccine if you don't have it, but at mm-hmm. the same time implying that life would be a lot easier if you were vaccinated, kind of thing. So yeah. that's it. It's, it's very dicey. I know it could be a very uh, divisive divisive subject to talk about and as far as i'm concerned though the cfl and the nfl they're doing what they have to do to ensure that the product stays on the field yeah for sure and that's really what it comes down to is making sure that players can still play we can still watch games everybody wins as far as i'm concerned and to me it's it's on the players to make sure that they're taking care of themselves like physically mentally emotionally it's making sure they're doing what they have to do to ensure that you know it if something happens, if, if there's a COVID outbreak on the team, you know, I guess it all depends on just how avoidable was it. And mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned, why not take the steps needed to you won't prevent it 100 percent. You can't say, you know, the shot doesn't prevent you from getting COVID. It just prevents things from getting really bad. But I mean, yeah. to me, it's to me, it's a matter of taking care of yourself and taking care of your teammates, your your family, your coworkers. It's however you want to phrase it. It's I understand the reasoning behind it. Um my, I, I'm calling it to, to me. It is for for these players that are not vaccinated for whatever their choice is. But this is a this is a forced incentive. <laughs> it's basically what it is, in my opinion. If I were to call I, call this what it is, it's a forced incentive. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, I just think it's whether you agree with it or not. That's that's a debate for another time. But I would look at it as it's part of what you have to do to ensure a safe work environment right and for you to be able to do your job to the best of your ability if this is something that you have to do to me that's really how i would kind of reframe it and look at it as okay this is a step i have to take in right. order to ensure that i can do what i'm supposed to be doing right and we'll, and we'll see what happens because you know we're still seeing the rumors that there may be a relaxation of the rules for fully vaccinated players and that again will be another incentive this won't be won't be a forced incentive but this will be another incentive too so mm-hmm. we'll see we'll see how it goes but then go you know stay stay uh you know keep checking out so- social media and we'll make sure that we give out any information that we do happen to get so absolutely uh, so we a hey, it is yeah you know, we're finally able to have a season premiere with the regular season again we're stoked we're going to be watching the games this weekend even though the owls aren't going to be playing but get ready 2021 is here and again, reminder, if you want to be included in the giveaway for that Alouette's cap from sportbuffshop.com, make sure you hashtag, reply and hashtag to any of our tweets, Sport Buff Flight Deck. Hashtag Sport Buff Flight Deck. So. Yeah, 100%. Like I said, this is a fire lid, as the kids say. So you, you got to make sure you get in on this. And if you can't wait. By all means, go to Sport Buff and uh, and buy yourself one. But if you want a chance to grab one of these completely free, mm-hmm. like I said, hashtag Sport Buff Flight Deck. Exactly. Talk so, to us. Engage with us. It all counts. Any, any chance you get to use that hashtag, do so. And uh, right. this time next week, you could be the proud owner of that, that really sweet ball cap. There you go. So, Cliff, I will talk to you soon, my friend. Stay safe and enjoy week one of the CFL season for the first time since Grey Cup 2019. So yes. yes, football is back, baby. I know I, it's I, great. I know. Can't can't yep. complain. Can't complain. Yep. So for everybody here at the Alouette's Flight Deck for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. We're on final approach.